Welcome back to Podcast Recovery. We are your hosts, David O. And Carly R. Uh, Today we are joined by Emily. Emily, how are you doing today? Doing all right. Um, You know, end of the work week, feeling good. It's Friday evening, you know? (laughs) Absolutely. Spectacular. All right. And where are you from? Um, Originally from Dallas, Texas, but I've spent a large portion of my life um, in Maryland, and I really couldn't say, like, an exact city. I've been all around. But yeah, Maryland's the majority of the my home. <laughs> I did not know you were from Dallas. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I got brought up uh, when I was, we got brought up from Texas when I was around seven for my dad's job, and I kind of tried to go back, and then I just got stuck in Maryland. But you don't, good. you don't really fit the Texas mold, like, in my mind, which I don't even know what that means. But I, I just feel like you're more Maryland than Texas. That's just me. Anyway, keep going, Carly. All right. And Emily, when were you first introduced to recovery? Oh, man. Uh, I would say early 20s, if I remember correctly. It didn't stick the first time. Um, I was introduced through, like, a variation of institutions via, like, the mental health track. And I didn't stay, but um, eventually I did come back of my own accord, and that is when I stayed. And okay. I would say that's around 24 at this point. I was 24 years old. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. So when is your clean date? March 8th of 2013. So I think I, I think according to math, I celebrated eight years recently. Congratulations. Yay! That's awesome. It's a miracle. And uh, (laughs) with all that out of the way, uh, for anybody who's uh, joining us for the first time, Emily was actually our very first podcast recovery episode. So this is round two. This is Emily Mach 2 on podcast recovery. So uh, that was 2018. It is now 2021. Give us a, a... Give our give our listeners a, a quick rundown of what they missed the first time and uh, what they've uh, been missing in the, the journey of Emily the last three years. Take it away. Sure. Um, honestly, I I listened to the first podcast recording an entirety of one time, and that was back when it first aired. And I haven't listened to it since. I, I don't have a really strong memory of what I talked about. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I remember talking a lot about my active addiction because there's some really fun stories there. Yes. Um, and I'm pretty sure I talked about a good chunk of my recovery leading up to the time um, that we recorded. Mm-hmm. But like, I'll, I'll try to give like a high level, like a synopsis, I guess. Um, so as far as using goes, I um, started fairly early, around 12 years old. Um, I definitely saw living life as a painful experience, and I found the like solution to escaping that pain through the use of drugs. Um, and it was like a solution for a fairly good amount of time, um, although I did pick up some consequences. Um, None of it, thankfully, on paper. Uh, Most of it Mm -hmm. was, um, you know, unrecorded. I get lucky sometimes. Uh, But (laughs) I did a lot of like, you know, when you, it's nice to not have a, a, you know, a, a legal recording of your Oh, that's and that, going that is that literally condition. that is literally Eric's story, and we've talked about this. He just failed upwards. That's just how he did things, and it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd like to think that it was some sort of intervention. Um, I just what I do know is that I'm really grateful for the fact that like it was at least material, like legal wise, it was pretty easy for me to clean up. Uh, the wreckage of my past uh, internally is a little bit harder um, 
my active addiction took me to a lot of dark places. I did a lot mm. of like going in and out of mental institutions. Like there was a 10 year period that like every fall, like clockwork, I was going inpatient and you know, the, the psychiatrist didn't really know what to do with me. Um, I was using uppers, I was using downers, I was using this, using that. Mm -hmm. And when you're lying to your medical professionals, they just do what they can to treat the symptoms. Right. Um, so I had picked up like a bipolar diagnosis, uh, you know, that was, preceded by a depression diagnosis, like, it was just, is a lot. Um, mm -hmm. And, like, when I finally, you know, decided to do this recovery thing and got clean, I was on, like, four separate psychiatric medications with five extra medications mm -hmm. to, like, manage those side effects of the four. You know, like, it was a mess. Oh, I was yeah. a mess. I remember. Was all a mess. <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't mean, do? like, you being a mess. Like, I, I, I remember the, the mountain of medication. That's what I meant. <laughs> Yeah. Save yeah. And that, that was definitely post. like, <laughs> oh, that was a journey to get, um, that all sorted out, you know? And like, it was part of, it was part of like making amends to myself really was taking responsibility for my mental health because I do have, um, certain conditions that I need to manage. And, um, you know, taking responsibility for mental health and like really, like diving into, you know, the principles of recovery via the fellowship that I entered into, Narcotics Anonymous, um, and like doing the internal work. It was like mm -hmm. a lot. <laughs> it's a lot of work, uh, but it was worth it. You know, like I really feel like it was worth it. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, uh, active addiction was a lot of craziness. Um, a lot of like. I was, uh, I was victimized a lot. Um, I wasn't really much of a perpetrator of crimes in my active addiction. I was more like the person who went to the wrong place at the wrong time and had to like suffer for that kind of a thing. Mm. Um, and you know, like that was fun picking up some trauma and some, you know, bringing that baggage into recovery. It was just a mess. And if you want to know like the nitty gritty of the really fun stories of active addiction, like definitely go to my previous episode because that's mm. about as the, the furthest extent that I want to go into active addiction. Um, but like getting clean and like entering into recovery, um, I mentioned earlier that I was introduced to recovery through like institutions, right? Um, mm -hmm. Like what the, like one of the latter visits to inpatient, somebody finally picked up on the fact that like maybe my drug usage was a thing and I got kind of categorized into this co-occurring situation where I like had a mood disorder and a drug problem and I was um, able to, or like I guess witness, I didn't really participate, but like witness uh, kind of hospitals and institutions versions of meetings and uh, like it, you know, recovering addicts would bring the meeting into the institution and like do like a light version of it, kind of give you a taste of what is possible when you get out. Um, and like I had gone to this day program post inpatient where like I was strongly encouraged to, to go to a meeting and it was like, there's a lot of like coercion, you know what I mean? <laughs> and I know like they're, you got dope feeded I mean, into a meeting. Yeah, pretty much. Mm -hmm. And like, that's, that's the way I saw it. And I, I understand like on this side of that perspective, like it, it's well intentioned. And honestly, like if I hadn't been quote unquote, strongly encouraged to go to this meeting, I don't think I would have ever found recovery mm. really. Um, because like, yeah, I wasn't open to it at the time. And I thought it was crazy and people were hugging me and that was uncomfortable. And like, I like had a huge problem with the whole situation. Like the fact was I knew that it existed at that point. Um, and like the seed was planted, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and I came back, I think I used for like nine months more after that. And like, I had been clean for a little while thanks to, you know, being institutionalized and, the drugs worked again instead of just getting me well. And, you know, I kind of enjoyed this one last, uh, run of like 
let's take the entire 10, you know, 11 years of using and mush it into nine months just to remind you of how horrible that decision is. Um, and yeah, like just picked up a couple more consequences and kind of reached a point of desperation. That was like a gift really. And, uh, and I, I, I swear to you guys, like I came back to Narcotics Anonymous of my own accord, not to get clean and not to get better, but because nobody else wanted to talk to me. Mm. Um, and like the thing that I remembered from that, like coerced meeting, right. Was like, they didn't, nobody knew who I was, but they were happy to see me. Mm. Um, which is not something that you get very often doing the things that I did. Mm -hmm. And so, I went there for friendship and I kind of like got clean and whatever because that's what everybody else was doing. And then I kind it kind of just like rubbed off, I guess. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And, um, eventually, eventually I subscribed, you know, to the whole thing. I drank the Kool-Aid and, um, I didn't die. <laughs> Contrary to some thought, I like <laughs> found a new life, <laughs> you know, like, uh -huh. I found a new life. Um, and like I had mentioned earlier that a lot of the damage that I caused, um, during active addiction to myself was like internal, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't go to jail. I didn't have an arrest record. I didn't have charges, but I did have a lot of, I was broken. Mm -hmm. Um, can and I hit, like, can I hit the pause? To, can I hit the pause button real quick? Yeah. Carly, have you ever been arrested? No. Really? Really. Eric, you got arrested, right? Once. It was possession, right? Yep. Okay. All I have is an alcohol citation. You have an alcohol citation? Mm -hmm. From when? <laughs> Freshman year of college. You know they can't be expunged. I know. That sucks. Oh, well. Have you ever been asked about it in a job interview? Nope. Oh, okay. <laughs> Lame. Okay. All right. Sorry. Back, back to you, Emily, with the, with your no convictions. No, <laughs> I think it's, you know, it's, you know, we don't have to get arrested and know that we need help, <laughs> you know? No. Um, but yeah, so I was told in Narcotics Not in this meeting that like I would find a new way to live. Mm -hmm. Um, and I did, but like there were some growing pains for me mm -hmm. and I did not, I don't think I recovered very gracefully in my first few years. And if you want the details on that, go to the previous podcast episode. Yep. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's a lot of fun stories about that. Yeah. And, yeah. um, I'm trying to, yeah, you would know, wouldn't you, David? I, I um, you know, i I wasn't going to go there. I was, I, I was, yeah. I, I was giving su supportive banter. <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> so, I mean, I'm trying to like think about where I was in 2018. Um, geez. You know, what's funny is like, I'm pretty sure. Cause like I'm thinking about the, the relationships that I had at the time and mm -hmm. you know, like where I was in my, my job and, and, and stuff like that. And like, <sighs> I'm pretty sure that like the last recording that I did was the beginning of the end of the relationship I was in at the time. Mm. Like no lie. Cause I, that, um, I was dating this woman at the time mm -hmm. and, uh, she, I had, you know, like I, I told her I was recording this thing, blah, blah, blah. And she's, you know, she's a, a non, -reco she's not an addict, right? Mm -hmm. um, she's a, a normie person. And and she wanted to hear it. And I said, yeah, sure, no problem. And then she listened to it and she's like, I don't know who you are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, it was just so, it was like a whole thing. And, you know, our relationship lasted a little bit longer, but eventually it like deteriorated into this whole like, you're not open with me. I, you know, you're like a stranger. You only show me what you want me to see. Like essentially like I'm not vulnerable. Right. And, um, that relationship ended mm -hmm. and it was painful and it's fun because like 
she was right. Oh. Um, I was not vulnerable with her. Uh, I did show her a version of myself that I thought was like the person that I should be. And mm. it wasn't because it wasn't really even out of malicious intent. It was just because I didn't want her, like, I don't know, I guess I was still, I still felt ashamed about who I was and where I came from. Mm. I mean, I remember being extremely grateful to be where I was. Right. But it was very much a, let me distance myself from the person I used to be. Um, mm. and you know, like that's neither here nor there, mm -hmm. uh, I guess. Mm. Um, you know, it, it, I learned something very important from that relationship with her and I'm, I'm sad that it ended, but like, I think it had to be that way. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, so, geez, um, in the last three years, I've done a lot of like, I can't believe I'm a recovering addict thing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, I like, you know, I'm in this, I will say that I'm in this relationship with a, with this man now and, you know, we're going to celebrate three years in June and like, I am vulnerable in this relationship and mm -hmm. it's terrifying yeah. And awesome. And, um, you know, we're like building a life together, which is pretty cool. Um, and so that's nice. But mm -hmm. like in 2019, I bought a house, mm -hmm. uh, that's by myself. Big, that, 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 um, that's big shit. Yeah. Right. Um, and I, up until the day I signed the papers, I did not see myself as a homeowner. Like no lie. I never thought I'd ever buy a house, but like, mm. you know, I was talking to my mother about fiscally responsible things. And like, I had just, you know, earned a new job that was super high paying and required a location change. And like, it just was more fiscally responsible to buy a house than pay rent. Like it was just, this is just ridiculous. I cannot fucking believe I'm having these conversations, yeah. right? Like I talk to people, I talk to financial advisors about retirement planning you know what I mean? Yeah. Like I care about what's going on in the world because it affects my, in, my like investments in the market. Like this is fucking insane. Yeah. That's a, that's and a like, far cry from <laughs> whence you came. Yeah. Like I was living $20 at a time. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like there was no such thing as signing a lease, let alone a mortgage agreement. And like, that might be a just, good, here I am. That might be a good title. Yeah. I was living my, my, my life $20 at a time. That's a pretty sweet title, but keep going. I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 Um, like, dude, I was, I, today is payday and I was balancing my budget. You know what I mean? Like it just, <laughs> mm -hmm. like it, it just blows my mind sometimes. And what's really funny, you know, it's hilarious. That bought that house I bought mm -hmm. in 2019. It's currently on the market. I'm trying to sell it because, like, we're in an unprecedented housing market that's favorable to sellers, and I yeah, have the flexibility to, like, <laughs> right? Isn't well, it? Isn't I'm it? trying to buy right now, so I'm on the under other end of that, and it is fucking bullshit. Yeah, yeah. and like, we so might have I a hookup have right here. House. Buyer and seller on the same line. Hey, yo. <laughs> Just no. Sorry. I'm not a realty guy. Eric, okay, Eric, so, make this um, happen. But the house God. is on the market. Sorry, house is on the market. Yeah, Go. So the, like, I've been in this house a sum total of 18 months. And, like, I think I put a couple thousand in it to make it look nice or whatever. But, mm -hmm. like, I'm, I saw, like, a change and, like, an opportunity. And, like, you know, I consulted people with more experience than me and they're like, this seems like a pretty good idea. And you have a sound, you know, action plan and like, I'm fucking doing it. And I stand to like, not lose money. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. and I'm over here like, you know, strategically selling real estate property to maximize my investments and worrying about capital get like, what the fuck? Good Lord. <laughs> Who are you? Is this the same Emily yeah. we had on three years ago? It's not good. It 100% is not, you know what I mean? Cause like I didn't stop my process, you know, at that, 
I w- had gone a long way and I had learned a lot, th- a lot of good things, but like I didn't stop. Right. Mm -hmm. Like the person who was on this podcast three years ago would never fucking imagine that I would be talking about the things I'm talking about now. Mm -hmm. Being in a committed monogamous relationship with somebody who, who with, I'm planning my life like that. No fucking way. Mm -hmm. Three years ago, I would have not uh, thought about owning it. Like it just, and like three years ago, I never thought I would have such a deep understanding of my own self, you know? Um, like I continued in the process. I don't remember where I was in 2018 in the steps, but at this point I finished That's a better title formally to write that down. writing the steps. <laughs> um, and like learned so much. Like I've, I've created and maintained and like nourished this relationship with a higher power that like mm. has brought so much peace like more peace and like understanding and like, I don't know. I don't know, man. It's sometimes it's really freaking hard to put words to it, but like, Mm -hmm. I don't, the thing is like today, I don't see myself as a separate person from who I was in active addiction. Like I I see myself as a whole human Mm. who like did those things when she was 20 and is also doing things now when she is 30 Mm. and it's all just me. Um, I don't know. It's yeah. So here I am like speaking about things that I wouldn't dare even like care to think about 10 years ago, three years ago, whatever. Um, and it's just life, you know, I'm just, just trying to live my life one day at a time. And like, you know, what's so funny. I know I'm like, I'm trying not to, take too long to talk right but like i'm not i'm gonna have to acknowledge the fact that like we're in the middle of some sort of pandemic Mm -hmm. situation Mm -hmm. um because it was extremely impactful to me like i as a as an introverted type person when people were saying lockdown i was saying hell yes oh Um, yeah you mm -hmm. you and eric yeah yeah and i just could not I was so excited to have an excuse to the cancel plans that was valid and nobody could argue against it, you know? Yep. And I isolated myself to the point of um, being suicidal. Mm. Uh, and so like, yes, things are great and awesome. And I have these new amazing levels of peace and serenity and, everything is so lovely. Thank you. Recovery. But also when I'm not vigilant, um, when I don't keep doing the things that I'm supposed to do to maintain that shit, Mm -hmm. I get right back to where I was in 2013. Mm. In 2013, before I got clean, I was actively trying to kill myself. Mm -hmm. And then I found myself in the middle of summer, you know, best time of year in the middle of summer in this pandemic, like wanting to die. And I had no idea why. <laughs> um, and like, lo and behold, I went back to doing the things that I was taught to do, right? Like I, I talked to other addicts in recovery. I, you know, reached out to my friends. I talked to my sponsor and I just shared exactly where I was at and like received this amazing outpouring of love. And like, it was made so apparent to me that like, I don't, I could have absolutely nothing to offer and I still deserve to be loved. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, which some for somebody like me, that's really hard to forget. Um, that like intrinsic, intrinsically, I am deserving of giving and receiving love, and it, like no, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't need to be clean to be loved. I don't need to be successful. I don't need to be nice because mm-hmm. um, I'm just loved. And, uh, that's pretty cool, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess that's what's been happening in the last three years. <laughs> Perfect. All right. We definitely have some questions for you and I won't even yeah. bother asking this week since apparently I always go first. That's rude. Would you like to go? No. <laughs> God damn it. Yes, actually you... I would. Okay. Then go ahead. Um, so you mentioned a lot of like being more 
broken internally um, through active addiction. So we'll kind of talk about the process of like trying to heal that internal self. Mm. Oh, geez. <laughs> oh, that's a hard, that's a good, that's a heavy side. question that really turns the tables on me, huh? Mm-hmm. How do I, how do I describe a multi-year process? <laughs> um, Two minutes, go. Take as long as you need. Yeah, right? Shut the fuck up, David. I'm sorry. I mean, like, so I guess the simplest way I can put it is I used the, I used the steps. I had to seek outside help. So like I was, you know, I've been in and out of therapy since I was 12. All right. But like, I actually started using a therapist four years ago. Um, And, you know, part of that whole taking responsibility for my mental health, right? I found a therapist who specialized in it facing and like worked with her actually worked. And a lot of it was like time, um, time and like being forgiving of myself. Um, yeah, I think that's the simplest way I can put it. All right. All right. Love it. Um, hmm. <laughs> what question am I going to go with? Um, so how did your recovery change through the pandemic? Oh boy. Um, recovery became more intentional for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I learned that cause you know, like the, the places that I w- became accustomed to going to were taken away from me mm-hmm. and you know, that, the, the church basements and the parking lots and the, you know, the scheduled times when I knew I would see my friends or my sponsor or whatever, right? Like those, that was taken away from me. Mm-hmm. And like, I had to consciously reach out and touch these people, right? Like reach out and like call my friends and I'm not a phone person and I had to do it. Right. Mm-hmm. And like doing these zoom meetings or whatever, um, it's actually hard um because sometimes it doesn't feel like i'm connected but like what really what it what, what helped for me like i i had to change my perception my perspective on the whole thing right mm-hmm. so like i was i became accustomed to like feeling this amazing recovery energy in an in-person meeting and like getting to socialize with my friends and like all these things in this beautiful package right uh and then the whole, like that package became a little bit more compartmentalized for me. Um, Mm -hmm. so like zoom meetings for me are where I go to listen, um, and like receive. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, and maybe identify people who I want to like talk to and connect to. And those connections for me are more one-on-one. Um, so like it would be consciously reaching out to that person and saying, Hey, can we like, talk on the phone or whatever, have like a outdoor socially distanced meeting or, Mm -hmm. you know, just like me and them. Right. So like, yeah, like it, it became less of an all inclusive package and more of a like a la carte, (laughs) I guess situation, but it definitely put a lot, put a lot of, um, responsibility on my shoulders more so than before. Um, and yeah, I had to become more intentional and more, uh, conscious about my recovery for sure love that and the the culinary reference of the a la carte recovery (laughs) chef's kiss chef's kiss to that this is this is no uh prefix uh menu here you 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 take what you want whatever whatever you'd like to order and uh carly made a face when you were talking about the zoom meetings and i I, i'd like to i don't even remember she was talking about like, uh, oh, these people are somebody I want to connect with. And you were just like, no, I just put those fuckers on mute. <laughs> mm, I no. don't know. You don't know? I, I'm, I don't remember what my face was for. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Moving on. <laughs> um, hmm. <laughs> now I lost my question. Um, oh. Which step do you feel has been most impactful in your recovery? Mm. Oh, oh, okay. Um, 
that's like asking me which one of my cats are my favorite. Ooh, like I, you can't just pick. Right? Like I can't. But here I'll say this: um, the different steps have been more impactful to me at different points hmm. in my life. Um, that's a very diplomatic like, answer. I like it. That's fine. Well, I mean, it's true. Like right now, yeah. I am so. I am hardcore in step three and step 11 right now. Like that's what's relevant to me right now Mm because I'm making huge life changing decisions and like essentially trying to figure out what the right choice is, right? Like seeking out, like making conscious contact with my higher power and like using that relationship that I have fostered to say like, all right, what am I supposed to be doing here? What's your will for me? Right. Cause like, I'm like going to sell my house and not buy a new one and like try to rent some place and like, so it'll, well, it'll work out. It'll be fine. Right. Yeah. Um, like I, and, and then the step three part of it is like, okay, I know which direction I'm supposed to be going now, but like how the hell am I going to get there? And what is this outcome going to be mm-hmm. going to be? Right. And so like, I just do the things that I know I'm supposed to do. Right. Like get my shit out of my house, clean it up pay somebody to put it on, you know, list it. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, and then the rest just leave it up to my higher power. Like, I don't know how many, if I'm going to get offers or like if I'm even going to make money or like whatever. Right. That's up to my God to like figure out I've already done my footwork and now I just trust that it's going to work out the way it's supposed to work out. Mm -hmm. Um, and like, no lie, it's been working out pretty well. (laughs) Yeah. Um, so yeah, today it's three and 11 for sure. Um, but I remember when when six was like all up in my face mm-hmm. uh, when I was doing a lot of work on my trauma um, six and seven, you know, like identifying my defects of character and my shortcomings and like asking God to remove them. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like because if I I could have gotten rid of them, they would have been gone a long time ago. Yeah. Um, doesn't like, doesn't work like that. No, it doesn't, and you know part of my healing, my trauma was like identifying my defects of character and like letting them go Mm. because I had developed these things that protected me in traumatic situations that were damaging my relationships today. Mm. Um, yeah. So I remember six and seven being a big deal Mm -hmm. and and, you know, uh, obviously in the beginning of my recovery, step one and two and three were mm-hmm. like, that, that was it. That was all I could do. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. You know, just admitting I was powerless and like figuring out that there was a power greater than me that could handle that shit I was powerless over. And then like allowing that power to do what it's supposed to do. You know what I mean? Like those three things, I still go back to those three every day almost hell yeah um yeah awesome all right um yeah hmm, hmm, hmm. Hmm. which one do i want to go with okay um so they we we always talk about how recovery is um mind mind body and spirit now I'm, i'm channeling my eric here um we feel like one of the one of the biggest things and i i agree with eric eric's a very big stickler on this is that like one that kind of gets forgotten a little bit is our our body health like our actual legitimate physical wellness and i know that's definitely been a a a big part of your journey so how has your physical health and like the attention you've paid to it over your recovery how has that changed um for the better and, and what sort of things have you done to get where you are today? (laughs) I love this one. (laughs) Um, so I was not very good at it, uh, in the beginning. Um, you know, I had to like prioritize based on my abilities at the time and not doing drugs was very hard. And so the rest kind of like, I gave myself a pass, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, totally. And so I had to like relearn basic hygiene, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, brushing my teeth regularly, uh, showering regularly, uh, getting my hair cut 
um, occasionally, which I'm still not very good at. But like, there was a period of time after like a horrendous breakup <clears throat> that like I kind of. Whoa, uh, <laughs> that was so much fucking shame. <laughs> <laughs> that was so much shade for any of our listeners and yeah. em- Emily and I were in a relationship in early recovery. Okay. There it is. Apparently it was a horrible, <laughs> horrible breakup. And I don't want to talk about it right now. Go ahead, Emily. Continue. I was terrible to you. Oh, I God. was a, we like, were both terrible. hateful person to you. Oh. And like, I ate my feelings through all of that. And like, I gained like 50 pounds or something stupid and got like super fat and unhealthy. And I wasn't super fat. I was very unhealthy though. And like I was smoking and it was just a whole fucking mess. Um, and like I had to, just like I had to relearn basic hygiene. I had to relearn what it meant to eat healthily, I guess, eat to mm-hmm. like nourish my body instead of like eating to make myself myself feel better um and like learning how to move um to like make my heart and my muscles stronger Mm -hmm. right and like I'm a super analytical human being so I went the way of like googling the fuck out of all of it and then like of course just you know being doing like a data-driven uh like method and I ended up losing (sighs) the, the 50 pounds or whatever and like I started running um 5Ks and I ran a 10K across the the Bay Bridge. That was really? kind of cool. Yeah, um, awesome. and I, I ran like this this thing called Ragnar, which is like I had to run 16 miles in the woods. Like it, it was a relay race. It was a whole crazy thing. It, it rained. It was muddy. It was crazy. Yeah, um, yeah got into running. <laughs> got a lot of outdoor like rock climbing and kayaking and all that stuff. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, so I was, I, I became strong. Uh, mm-hmm. I made my body strong and healthy. Um, and I still try to keep that balance, uh, with my job. My job is a very sedentary job. I, I'm an IT professional. And mm-hmm. so like my movement is, is something I have to consciously do as well. <laughs> um, yeah. And like for me, uh, my physical recovery was also like, uh, part of it was my sexual health. Um, I have a lot of sexual trauma in my past Mm -hmm. and like trying to relearn how to be like a sexual being in a healthy, non-traumatic way was, and still is a challenge. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, like I, I learned very recently, very recently, like this in the past couple of months that like, I have a disconnect. Like I, I've like denied my womanhood kind of a thing, right? Like I, I have a, a, like some weird sort of disconnect between my body and my brain. Like I'm reject, like I like, I reject my body and it kind of manifests most obviously. And like somebody gives me a compliment about my physical self and I get offended because I feel like they're denying my personhood by focusing on my body. And that's kind of fucked. (laughs) Uh Um, so like I'm I'm still working through that, but it's like reintegrating my physical self into my identity has been like a wild ride. Um and like I'm pretty fortunate to have a very understanding and patient partner uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> through all that process mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah. Fantastic. That was a great answer. What you got, Carly? All right. Um Do you still or currently have any unresolved resentments? I'm about to have a resentment against my cat. Dan, get away from here. Stop it. You're being mean. (laughs) My, sorry, my, my oldest is torturing my youngest because he wants attention. How Um, many cats do you have? I have two. Uh, I have a newly six-year-old black domestic short hair named Bonsai, Mm -hmm. and he has a younger sister who's a gray tabby who will be six in July, and uh, yeah, also domestic short hair, and they are definitely siblings. Um, They act that way. Anyway, so unresolved resentment. I don't... I don't think I 
I might have to do the fourth step all over again because <laughs> I don't think I can think of any resentments. Mm. That's, oh, I had to work through some real, sh- like, shitty ones. Um, like, I had this huge-ass resentment against my father for the way he treated me when I was a child. I got to, that took years, years of crying in meetings and, like, mm. being, like, refusing to do anything about it and, mm-hmm. like, I had an amends to make there and, you know, today I have a serviceable relationship with my father. Serviceable. Wow. I have a relationship that is, you know, good for the both of us um, with him. Yeah. Like, geez, I don't think I do. Oh, shit. Do you have any lingering? That's all you got. Do, do you have any unresolved resentments, Carly? I'm sure I, ha- I do. I, do I want to talk about them? No. I think you kind of do. <laughs> I have a resentment against you right now. Okay. that's. Do we want to talk about this? No. Okay. Oh, I definitely have a, I definitely have an unresolved resentment. 100%. And I don't know if I'll ever fucking resolve it, honestly. Like, maybe for, like, personally I might, but I don't know. I've, I've, I've just literally put that, like, and Emily knows. Like, probably, I don't know. Anyway. Um... Yeah, my fucking, my dad's total piece of shit. Total piece of shit. Fucked me up for a long time. And, I, like, I've dealt with it through therapy somewhat, uh, but not completely. And I definitely still harbor a huge resentment about it. But I'm not, I, you know, I'm I'm not there. And it's and it's comfortable in its, in its compartment right now. And I don't feel like <laughs> addressing it. So I'm, I'm, I'm not going to. That's totally fine. You put me on blast, so... I, I, I wasn't putting you on blast. I, I was just... <laughs> well, Emily, okay, since we can't think of resentments, what about any lingering character defects? Ooh. Oh, my God. So many. Um, <laughs> so here's the go. deal, right? Like, here's the juice. <sighs> that's the thing, right? So character defects, at least from my point of view... Like, I identify them, and it's not like they get lifted and they go away forever. Mm -hmm. Like, they're 100% available for me to pick up off the shelf anytime I feel like it. Oh, yeah. Um, Like, when it... it, So, the the fellowship I'm in, Narcotics Anonymous, they have this whole thing of, like, you get a daily reprieve from addiction, right? Well, you also... I feel like I also get a daily reprieve from my character defects. And, like, um, you know, it's, it's not... It's not guaranteed, I guess is what Mm -hmm. I'm trying to say. Depending on my spiritual condition, I can reach for all sorts of shit. And like, I think the one that I like to reach for the most is like, the best way I can describe it is the illusion of control. Cause I know better. I know better today that I don't actually have control, Mm -hmm. but like controlling my surroundings was my number one, like security blanket kind of, uh, behavior. And so I will like try to control people, Mm -hmm. places and things a hundred percent of the time. And when I feel that urge to like put my fingers in it, um, that's when I know like I got to check myself, uh, cause something's off. Mm -hmm. Um, Cause when I'm, when I'm on my shit, I don't feel the need to fuck with other people's shit, Mm -hmm. I guess. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. I think, um, what about you, Carly? And what about me? I'll go first, and then we'll, we'll both lingering, or or what what character defect have we acted out on most recently, all three of us? We're going to do... <laughs> um, I'll go first. Um, uh, honestly, probably gossiping in an unhealthy way, and mostly at work. Because mm. work has been difficult recently, and I deal with people who who are not great at their jobs, and I am willing to open my mouth about it, and sometimes in not a very friendly way, and that can manipulate other people's feelings of them. I'm not doing it intentionally to manipulate these people against the other person, but I I can see how my negative speaking of an individual can then uh, influence another person's thinking. So that's probably the character defect I've been acting out on most recently, which isn't mm-hmm. isn't great. 
What about you, Emily? What what character defect have you have you exercised recently? Oh, oh, that would definitely be procrastination. Um, I got like a total case of Friday itis. Yeah, and. I really hope nobody I work for hears this because I spent the last four hours of my day today playing Nintendo Switch <laughs> in Duh. front of my computer <laughs> instead of like doing any work. Um, I was like in meetings, not talking, right? And playing mm-hmm. Nintendo Switch because like it's Friday and I'm tired. <laughs> mm-hmm. What were you playing? Uh, don't don't put me out like that. Oh, no, I'm putting you out. Animal no. Crossing. You were playing Animal Crossing? What? Yeah. Okay. All right. That's the, I'll, I'll leave it at that. There's no judgment. I get to fully control everything about my island. Why would I not play Animal Crossing? Okay. I am going to put you on blast about something. So where has so- our addiction manifested itself in lately? <laughs> what, did, what did you used to do in The Sims, Emily? Wait, do the who, what, what? I didn't hear you. When you, when you used to play The Sims, what did you used to do? And you know what I'm talking about. Oh, shit. Um, I don't... Do you want me to do it? Okay. What are you talking about? So David? you told me when you used to play The Sims, you would put people in the pool and then remove the ladder and Take the, the ladder stairs <laughs> so they would just swim around until they died and you would just watch it. Yeah. Jesus, Eric, (laughs) you just came out from behind the curtain for some morbid ass shit like that. Good Lord, man. (laughs) Oh, only we can hear you. Oh, God, that's even creepier. (laughs) Tell me you didn't do that, Emily. I did it. I I think I also like let them. I think I took the doors out when the house is on fire. too. (laughs) I was, I was, you know. That's a level of control that's, like, scary, though. That's, like, at least you didn't graduate past the virtual. That's good. That's a good thing. I couldn't hurt animals. No, know, exactly. So I wouldn't be able to get to that. I can't go up that escalation route. No, but notice how she did not say humans. Right. That's what I'm concerned about right now. <laughs> oh, no. I've always been very confident that Emily would be an amazing serial killer. She'd be very thorough, and she would not get caught. No. Did I make it too weird? I made it too weird. Okay. How about you? So do we have any other questions? <laughs> Carly, what 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 character defect? Perfectionism. Oh. Mm. That's like an everyday thing that I know it's it just always there. I know. So I mean, yeah. Have you like I know that's like been been a thing for you. Like, how do you like work with that? Fuck if I know. <laughs> <laughs> If you have any suggestions, let me know. I've done some research. <laughs> I've done some research into this, actually, because I also suffer. Um, and it's allowing yourself not to do like uh, like something perfectly. And what I've uh, what has been suggested to me is like make bad art or like mm. sing off key and it's okay, um, mm. like that kind of stuff. So like very little minor things that like just to kind of like chip away. Yeah, you know. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. I like was that. not my idea. It was given to me. That seems like a herbism. That seems like a herb idea. The bad art. Probably not though. I might be attributing too much to him. I don't know, but uh, I think we are about out of questions. Do you have anything left? No. Wizard from behind the curtain. Do you have anything you want to fucking add? <laughs> No, he's good. Eric, Eric's strictly a producer now, so he he's just the the brain and where the where the where the face is. The voices. The voices. Yes, that's what, that's what I meant to say. Yeah. Okay, fuck you, Eric. All right. Well, we would like to thank our guest Emily for joining us this evening. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, Emily. I want you to take uh, a quick two minutes and. Uh, talk to straight to our listeners if they're struggling, need to hear like that message of hope. What do you have to say to them? Oh man, I know it sucks, it fucking sucks. But mm-hmm. like, the one thing I knew that I know is absolutely 100% true is that as long as 
you're alive, there's still a chance. Mm. Love it. That's perfect. Nice, short, and sweet. All right, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we here at Podcast Recovery need your help to keep the mics on. So please come be part of the Podcast Recovery family. Join our home group, our Patreon. Like, share, subscribe. Everything you see from our uh, wonderful uh, brain wizard, Eric, on uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. Like I said, like, share, subscribe. Maybe uh, become a part of our Patreon. It would be very, very helpful. And here at Podcast Recovery, we are aiming to expand the scope of support for recovering addicts. Accessibility and convenience of helpful services is paramount to combating addiction. We work to bring the message of recovery to every addict, wherever and whenever it is needed. We believe that powerful voice of recovery should be obtainable, practical, and at the touch of a button. Every addict deserves to hear a message of hope and podcast recovery is here to provide it. Again, thank you everybody for joining us, but most importantly, everybody out there, stay safe and stay clean. Nailed it.